how do we socially construct our identities? The mimetic theory of René Girard offers a unique explanation of the peculiar nature of human desire. We look to others to discover our desires. Desire is modeled. Who we think we are, this reveals much more, rather, about who we wish we could be. We look to our models. Girard finds this peculiarly mimetic nature of human desire unveiled in the best literature. Quite simply, the best literature is the most mimetic. That is, its portraits of identity show how the social construction of what we believe to be our own private possession, our identity, is publicly implicated, often in unflattering ways, in the social frenzy of mimetic desire. The world of advertising is founded on the mechanism of mimetic desire. We desire to buy something because it's portrayed as desired by others. But the advertisement works only if it flatters us with the lie that this desire is somehow our autonomous creation. We don't want to be copycats. We flatter ourselves that it is our own personal choice that is the origin of our desire to buy the product. This perpetuates the illusion that we construct our own identity. In reality, it's socially constructed. In all the many competing ways that our desire is being incited and mediated and modeled all around us by others. The TV series Mad Men depicts the intensification in modern media of a widespread, competitive, overt process of mediation. The cultural process of modeling desire. This intensification of mediation has affected human behavior in many ways with which we are now intimately familiar. But these ways were once not so familiar, and the TV drama of Mad Men shows their historical unfolding. Its probing literary method is to dramatize obvious mimetic behavior in order to invite the viewer to contemplate much less obvious mimetic behavior. Yes, there are the mimetic behaviors that we spot easily with the passage of time. Widespread smoking, drinking alcohol while pregnant, egregious littering, irresponsible parenting, gender roles with restricted, highly restricted degrees of freedom. And we flatter ourselves that we could never be so mimetically stupid as our benighted predecessors. But Mad Men's portrayal of such anachronistically, anachronistically obvious examples of social mimesis constitutes only the surface of its portrayal of the even deeper and ever-current dynamics of mimetic desire. As pundit Rod Dreher has noticed, the show is a melancholic meditation on identity. Its protagonist, Madison Avenue advertising executive Don Draper, there he is in the center. Draper is in every respect a self-made man. He's a creative director at the Sterling Cooper Agency. His greatest creation is himself. Born into a poor, miserable family, Dick Whitman took advantage of an accident of war to assume the identity of a dead soldier, becoming Don Draper. Well, when I rewatched the first two seasons, I was struck by two apparently innocuous lines of dialogue that were repeated again and again in the mouths of different characters. Look at you, and what do you want me to say? Now, one's first impression may be that this is the sort of thing that could be parodied, for example, in a Saturday Night Live sketch, because its repetition is so easily seized upon. One could fault the writers for lack of imagination. Look at you. Well, that clumsily punts the scenic drama from the writer into the hands of the actors, the wardrobe people. And what do you want me to say? Well, that's like writer's block incarnate on the page. 
Uh, it's like a placeholder to mark where dramatically interesting content is supposed to go until something clever and arresting can subsequently be constructed. Okay, uh, but to me, these are two examples of small, beautiful details in a carefully crafted drama. I don't think they're clumsy or unimaginative at all. I think they're revelatory. In a nutshell, they encapsulate the dynamics of mimetic desire. Look at you. When this slips out of a character's mouth, flatteringly or resentfully, its social meaning is that the person uttering it focuses intention on the other. Its hidden significance is that humans are always, humans are always looking to one another in search of desire. The explosive modern phenomenon of widespread advertising only makes this truth unavoidably obvious. Look at you. This is the compressed credo of any advertising firm's campaign. Buy this product, they say, and people will be looking at you. Looking at you as their envied mimetic model. The appeal of the advertisement is founded on this flattering lie. The unflattering literary truth, however, obvious, obvious at least to the firm that creates the advertisements, is that your desire for the product could never have been incited in the first place if you had not been looking at someone else. Look at you. The grass is always greener on someone else's lawn. And to complement that lawn, whether flatteringly, oh, look at you, <laughs> or resentfully, oh, look at you, <laughs> it's unavoidably a veiled expression of your own identity. Namely, the extent to which you yourself, secretly or not so secretly, desire to be looked at. Look at my lawn. <laughs> you desire to be looked at by possessing or even just by denouncing the best on the block. What do you want me to say? When this slips out of a character's mouth, its social meaning is that it expresses the frustration of the person uttering it. Frustrated at being confined by the socially constructed, socially confining role being imposed on that person by another person. Its hidden significance is that whenever humiliated by a rival from whom you're copying a desire, you are scandalized. Instead of simply walking away from the conflict of mimetic desire, you obsessively return to the person who modeled the desire for you in the first place. You demand them to provide the solution to your being blocked in your desire. What do you want me to say? But answering this demand is impossible because it's completely contradictory. The model, the source of the social construction of your desire, is being subjected to your demand that they stop inspiring your rivalry. Yet they are your rival only because you have always already placed this ridiculous demand on them in the first place. Be my model. You've made them into a false god, an exalted social model, because you falsely believe them to be the autonomous possessor of the desire that you wish likewise to make your own autonomous, magical possession. But such social autonomy which by kind of magical thinking you perceive to reside in your model, is in fact an illusion. Albeit the illusion which is now a cliched staple of the ad man's repertoire. It is a myth, which the mechanism of your mimetic desire can conjure into existence whenever you've encountered frustration, blocked desire, rivalry, scandal in the social dance of model desire. Think of Pete Campbell, who lives in Don's shadow and obsessively desires to be like him. Episode after episode, the two are locked in conflict, and the series masterfully portrays how Pete's serial humiliation by Don is the product of Pete's own obsessive, mimetic escalation of conflict. Yet, to my mind, even more fascinating than such not-so-private, dramatically explosive rivalries is the subterranean reach of our mimetic structures, which penetrate the depths of self-identity. For even Don Draper himself illustrates how wanting what other people want is something that reaches to the core of each one of us. Don Draper, who has constructed his own identity by exploiting the mechanism of mimetic desire to succeed as an ad man, precisely on the basis of his own uniquely intimate knowledge of that mechanism, Draper himself cannot escape from the full reach of that mechanism. 
which we find out, ironically implicates him in all the ways that he is powerless to escape. Now, in order to grasp this profound truth of mimetic theory, namely that mimesis, imitation, modeling, it reaches even into Don's lack of self-knowledge, to grasp this profound truth, we must first see what Don does know and does possess better than anyone else in the series. A penetrating understanding of the nature, the nature of human desire. Now, the philosopher Thomas Hibbs has insightfully explained in a recent lecture how Don Draper, the ad man, who wildly succeeds at inciting desire, has come to understand desire from within. Uh, Hibbs argued that the irony of Draper's character is that his ability to remember the past, which he desperately wants to forget, actually makes him a better advertiser. Quote, Draper grasps that it's not just novelty and freedom that people want, but they also want the idea of returning, of recovering the past. End quote. A past where family, friends, and emotional connection were more important than financial profit. Well, mimetic theory can be applied to build upon this key insight from Hibbs. In brief, mimetic theory allows us to appreciate just how inescapable the irony of mimetic desire is. Don, too, wants what other people want because this is the universal structure of human desire. Although in his deepest self-deceptions, best illustrated in all his romantic entanglements, he mistakenly thinks that he can escape this truth. For even if he is master at manipulating the desires of others, we see he is dramatically powerless to master his own desire, which is just as human and just as mimetic. The double bind in which he finds himself is that his whole persona, Don Draper, is a self-authored lie. Yes, it makes him a successful model desired by everyone else. But his own construction of this very lie is ironically what must also continually cut him off from any truthful human connection to or relationship with another person. For this reason, at the root of the double bind, there is what René Girard calls the romantic lie, a willful yet unknowing denial of our socially constructed identity. It's that self-flattering lie of self-authored autonomy that people fervently desire to weave into the fabric of their own identity. And ironically, this is always done at their own self-expense. In Don's case, the essence of his identity is that he must conceal, he must drape the real Dick Whitman with his romantic lie, Don Draper. The cynical version of this lie, in which he has concealed himself, and by which he maintains his cool superiority, is exactly what he spouts to Rachel Mankin when he ridicules her complaint of never having been in love. You're born alone and you die alone, and this world just drops a bunch of rules on top of you to make you forget those facts. But I never forget. Later on, thanks to Rachel having challenged him, in effect, she calls into question the lie of his self-authored autonomy. At the end of season one, when Don pitches to his clients at Kodak, the name for their slide projector reel, he does such an effective sales job because the old wound of his real self, Dick Whitman, is what most deeply desires the love of others. Don does not have to ask his clients, what do you want me to say? His own pain is what enables him to know best exactly what they want him to say. Nostalgia. It's delicate but potent. Teddy told me that in Greek, nostalgia literally means the pain from an old wound. It's a twinge in your heart, far more powerful than memory alone. This device isn't a spaceship. It's a time machine. It goes backwards, forwards. It takes us to a place where we ache to go again. It's not called the wheel. It's called the carousel. It lets us travel the way a child travels, around and around and back home again, to a place where we know we are loved. That natural human desire to be loved can ironically be undermined by the all-too-common, universally destructive patterns of rivalrous desire. Even Don's success, we learn, is his greatest weakness. 
because it alienates him from the possibility of turning weakness or failure into the opportunity for him to connect with others. Instead of playing the game of envy, where everyone looks at Don Draper and for one reason or another thinks, look at you, Don could instead abandon his cool superiority. He could cease being scandalized by the world, a world of rivals that drops a bunch of rules on top of you. He could simply admit what Rachel says. It's hard being a man, too. After all, the truth of Rachel's, Rachel's observation rests on the ironic fact that craving to be seen and to hear the words, I love you, every human being, man and woman alike, has fallen victim to mimetic desire. Well, such is human desire, with all of its peril and all of its promise, wonderfully and truthfully, I would say, portrayed in Mad Men. But where did human desire first come from? How is it different from merely animal desire? What's distinctively human about human desire? As we've seen, Girard's answer is that human desire is purely mimetic. But what was human desire's point of origin in history? I'd like to discuss now what I believe the best answer to this question is. The answer is, I think, to see with Girard how the origin of language is rooted in our animality. But a very influential mode of thought, semiology, has become famous in the 20th century by describing how language is allegedly something autonomous, something that has reference only to itself. And this approach has unlocked many insights about language, but it is far from the complete story. The blinkered vision of the semiological approach remains an obstacle for many today. Like the approach found in 20th century semiology, Eric Gans has a theory, generative anthropology, GA for short, which gives an account of the origin of language. But I say it's an account that goes awry. GA, gone awry. <laughs> Okay, well, why? Why is it gone awry? It severs the human animal from its animality. Because GA mistakenly makes the sign something distinctive only of the human. A better alternative to GA's account of human evolution is provided by Thomas Sebiok's hypothesis, not least because it adequately distinguishes adaptation from exaptation. Sebiok's global semiotics studies semiosis, the action of signs everywhere in the plant and animal kingdoms, everywhere on the globe. Sebiok's hypothesis that language in the root sense is part of a primary modeling system, as its biologically underdetermined part, avoids the error characteristic of GA and similar semiological approaches when treating semiosis, semiosis being the action of signs. These semiological approaches adopt a reductive hypothesis of language, reducing it to what is in fact only the secondary modeling system of linguistic communication, which system in turn makes possible cultural experience, the tertiary modeling system. René Girard's hypothesis, however, avoids this reductive error and accounts for the evolution of all the modeling systems with his account of the origin of human desire from rituals of violence. Girard's mimetic theory has articulated what he has described in his own words as, quote, a general theory of culture and its origins, end quote. Girard's mimetic theory, which observes, quote, the need for a purely generative anthropology, end quote, that is, an anthropology in which religion and culture is generated from violent origins, it's a theory that answers the question of the origin of the first consciously symbolic sign in human history. Girard sees that the origin, uh, Girard sees the origin as a reenactment of a violent scapegoating murder. A surrogate victim, a scapegoat, stands for something else as a sign of communal desire. And then this, this is repeated later as a ritual, a ritual sign of what the community desires. Girard thus offers the scapegoat as the foundation for the semiotic phenomenon of substitution in ritual violence. Girard focuses on, quote, the unstable structure of human relations in a world still ruled by violence and scapegoating, end quote. 
ruled by the god or gods of archaic religion, which he defines as characterized by the violent rituals of substitution. Concerning the historical order of the evolution of this violent sacred, Girard insists on, quote, the necessity of pre-linguistic solutions against violence, meaning that the, the very first scapegoating murder must have occurred temporally, in time, before the origin of the first symbolic sign of religious ritual. I would like to highlight Girard's reason for insisting on this. Namely, Girard emphasizes the fact that there are, quote, biological aspects that have to be taken into account in understanding the origin of language. The significance of Girard's approach is that his evolutionary hypothesis is consonant with the hypothesis of Thomas Sibiak about the place of language in defining the human species. For Sibiak, the modeling device of language, understood as species-specific to humans and as distinct from speech, linguistic communication, language is what properly enables humans to construct the sort of cultural models unique to the human species. So in light of Sibiak's theory, I'd like to suggest how Girard's hypothesis can account for the origin of violent religious ritual at precisely the moment of origin of the human species, understood in Sibiok's terms as the only species. Humans are the only species with language. So in order to show how promising Girard's theory is with respect to explaining the origins of what Sibiok describes, the species-specific modeling system in humans, I would first like to contrast Girard's mimetic theory with the attempted modification of mimetic theory by Eric Gans, who's developed a variation on it known as generative anthropology. Now, Gans and Girard have a fundamental, irreconcilable difference concerning the origin of language. I shall argue now that the work of Sibiak shows the distinct advantage that Girard's theory has in the attempt to describe the origin of the human modeling system, which Sibiak calls uh, language as the crucial part. So, first, here's what we're going to do, do now. First, I'll highlight the controversy between Gans and Girard. And second, I'll argue for the limits of Gans's approach in light of Sibiak's hypothesis. And finally, I will suggest how Girard's insights can be read as consonant with those of Sibiak. Sibiak's global semiotics considers modeling a pivotal notion. A pivotal notion. And if you got a copy of the handout, there's some extras at the edge of the stage. Uh, if you look at page 28 on the handout, the top of the handout, uh, page 28, um, it starts off by discussing Sibiak's global semiotics as a pivotal notion. And in my conclusion uh, to this presentation, I will state how Sibiak's modeling systems theory is consonant with Girard's mimetic theory. Well, what, what is uh, Gans's hypothesis? He says that a gesture becomes the first sign when it's mimicked by the entire animal gro group, so it now prevents them from all engaging in a vicious contest of violent reciprocity, right? So imagine that you're the proto-humanids, maybe you're fighting over the seats and you're hitting one another on the side of the head and it's a big crisis because, you know, who started it? It's getting out of control. Gan says, well, it stops when suddenly someone notices me up here. Hey, he's not in this. Someone points to me and then everyone else sees this and they all sort of point to me too. And suddenly this is like the first sign. Everyone's pointing, this first gesture, pointing Everyone realizes this is the communal object of de desire. Somehow I'm going to be the solution to your violent conflict. So you'll all lynch me, kill me, and uh, you know, this will make you feel better once you all discharge your, your uh, violence on me. And then you can reenact the peace that this brings by returning to either my corpse or to the spot where you murdered me by just pointing at the spot. And this is the origin of the first uh, sign in human history. Something of, of this scenario is the idea. But Girard says that this seems to be an unrealistic solution, right? That everyone stops and points, and that's the first sign. And then comes the scapegoating murder. Girard says the scapegoating murder comes first. Quote, how can a simple gesture, regardless of how ostensible it may be, how can a simple gesture prevent the mimetic doubles from killing each other? It's as if violence did not exist. It's another way of denying violence. I think that this is, again, a rhetorical maneuver to negate the primacy of religion in human culture. If one accepts Gans' hypothesis, then all other forms of social contract have also to be accepted. In order to have language, 
an embryonic form of culture is needed, some kind of cultural sheltering from violence. There must already be a non-linguistic solution to the problem of violence, which inevitably is a religious solution. And that is the result of the scapegoat mechanism, of the spontaneous grouping against an arbitrary common victim. For me, all insight into human origins must be anthropological. Every observation suggests that in human culture, sacrificial rites and the immolation of the victim come first. And this is the origin of everything else, starting with language." End quote. Girard, there he is on the left, and uh, Eric Gans on the right. Girard concedes that Eric is a great observer and his analyses of modern society are admirable. But, quote, in limiting the role of the emissary victim, Gans impoverishes mimetic theory and lets fall away whole areas of archaic anthropology, depriving us of a mass of significant and revealing correspondences that are fully illuminated by that theory. Nothing seems to me to justify his attitude other than the modern allergy to the religious, described by Cesario Bandera, end quote. Okay, so Girard's objection hinges on his observation that language is incapable of preventing any crisis of contagious, violent undifferentiation. Instead, there must first be a violent scapegoat before any language can emerge in the peaceful aftermath the scapegoat brings. So you're all fighting, and then suddenly you see me and say, hey, how did these get? And then you all beat up on me, and then after I'm dead, then you can point to me. And So the sign comes after the scapegoating murder. Girard says, quote, we cannot do away with the actual killing of a victim. This is the moment of supreme crisis, the moment when the group should be most willing to give up violence, the moment of maximum undifferentiation. You're all hitting each other the same way. When pure revenge, pure revenge is working on all levels, it's also the moment when they can least give up the violence. Right? How are we going to stop to point? Right? <laughs> at this stage, at the moment of supreme rage, supreme excitement, when you're out of your mind, ecstatic in the way of violence, there's no scope, no possibility for social contracts. This is the problem with Gantz. He minimizes violence, for he suggests an entirely linguistic form of dealing with violence. Indeed, he simply suppresses violence, and he envisages an embryonic social contract. Rather, I posit it at the very center. Violence at the center, as far as the beginning of culture is concerned. In other words, proper attention must be paid to the pre-linguistic, which lays the foundation for the linguistic phenomena that later make up human culture. That is, human culture is founded on religion and its ritual prohibitions and its highly controlled acts of violence. Right? An animal sacrifice is a highly controlled, or even human sacrifice when it's ritualized, it's a highly controlled act of violence. The scapegoat system makes culture. The scapegoat system makes culture possible at a pre-linguistic level. At some stage of the evolutionary path, which turns primates into humans, a sort of prohibition of a religious nature or some sort of fear of an immense invisible power at the most basic level triggered prohibitions against violence. So, in the beginning, a scapegoat murder is what the pre-humans accomplish. This then leads to unconscious reenactments. Right? You return to the stage, beat the spot where I was first killed. You don't know what you're doing, but it's repeated again and again. Unconscious reenactments that preserve the peace, right? You feel good not just when you've killed me, but just reenacting how good it made you feel. Reenactments that preserve the peace that scapegoating brings again and again. Violence escalated until the very end, demanding the founding murder. Starting from this event, peace was spontaneously established. And in order to preserve this peace, humans perpetuated both interdictions and sacrifices before the invention of language and other cultural institutions. At this level the scapegoat mechanism begins to be concealed. For we don't want culture and religion, above all, to be grounded on a founding murder, do we? Okay, so here Girard is denying that language, as we commonly use the term, like I have an English language translation of Girard's French language up on the slide, right? That's what we mean when we use the word language usually. Well, Girard is denying that language in that common sense originates anywhere near the time of the first scapegoating events and rituals. But he's doing so to emphasize his disagreement with Gans. And so we shouldn't take this remark uh, as a disagreement with Sibioc, of whom uh, Girard appears to be unaware. Otherwise, Girard would have said linguistic communication rather than language, if he knew Sibioc's terminology. Gans, however, doesn't, doesn't maintain that any advanced language, like French or English, is suddenly present at this point. But he does insist that a simple gesture, 
as the first human sign. It doesn't have to be verbal. This is the first sign. A simple gesture, says Gans. He thinks it's born somewhere around this originary scene of scapegoating. Gans thus emphasizes language, which begins with simple gestures, to be what's most characteristic of the human. Right? The human is the language user for Gans. But for Girard, it's rather not language, but religion that is most, char most characteristic. Men, like animals, have to feed themselves. But it is religion that makes them human. On the one hand, I think Girard is correct to see sophisticated products of evolution, such as linguistic communication, cultural institutions, individual autonomy, as anachronistic if we project them back onto his originary scapegoating scene. Girard sees Gans as proposing such an anachronism. Quote, these people don't see people like Gans and others who have the semiological approach through language. These people don't see the historicity of concepts such as individualism and choice. They have an ontological understanding of the human mind based on modern presuppositions. It seems evident to me that the human mind has been slowly shaped and trained through prehistory and history by religion and rituals. Modern individualism, that's nothing but the late result of this process, end quote. Well, on the other hand, in truth, Gans is not proposing any such anachronism. Gans is trying instead to think the origin of the first human sign in the gestures, right, proto-language, nascent on the scapegoating scene. But where I think Gans goes wrong is in positing the action of the signs here as uniquely human. Girard's emphatic point is that scapegoating first arises in our animality and then only gradually becomes more and more recognizably human. Gans's semiological hypothesis, however, disconnects the human from the animal by positing an abrupt break in order to define the origin of the human species with this first sign. Well, this posited break means that Gans's hypothesis is nominalistic for the reasons that I'll now explore. And uh, then I'll conclude with a suggestion about how Girard's gradualist hypothesis may nonetheless still account for a precise point at which the properly human species emerged. Well, what does GA have to do with the disaster of nominalism? Well, what's nominalism? It, it affirms that only uh, the sensible particular is real. Only the sensible particular is fundamental. And then it makes a fatal dichotomy, partitioning off the mode of being of the particular from the mode of being of language, which is entirely different. Well, with its explicit attempts at a treatment of transcendence, right, transcendence comes from language, argues Gantz. With its treatment of transcendence, GA certainly aspires to overcome nominalism, but I think in the end it fails to do so. Because in severing anthropology and language from animal life, GA remains nominalistic, trapped in the modern epistemological paradigm with its defective notion of what a sign is. In the way it conceives of representation, GA's originary scene, it's as disconnected from the external world as any idea or sense impression of Descartes, Locke, uh, Barclay, Hume, or Kant. All modern philosophy from Descartes on regards sense impressions or ideas as self-representing objects rather than other representing, which they can be only in semiosis by being part of the action of signs. The action of signs, signs that in their mode of being transcend subjectivities. Well, the first comprehensive treatment of the nominalism running through modern philosophy seems to be found in Steven Weinberg. But Charles Saunders Peirce certainly propounded the thesis. And John Dealey has recently and definitively established it, I would say. Uh, moreover, the problem of nominalism was not unknown to the neo-Thomism of the 19th and 20th centuries. And in fact, uh, recently John Dealey has highlighted, highlighted the lasting contribution that Thomas Aquinas has made to showing us how to overcome nominalism and to understand the action of signs. Okay, but what does GA's understanding of the sign have to do with nominalism? Well, it claims to be a new way of thinking, but in spite of its pretensions to be a new way of thinking, GA re recapitulates an error characteristic of the modern epistemological paradigm, semiological anthropocentrism. With its recurring refrain emphasizing a minimal anthropology, it repeats the myopic error of Descartes. 
and unwittingly adopts a kind of methodical doubt that makes it dogmatically agnostic about anything beyond its own minimal anthropology. Like the approach to language of 20th century semiology, GA is not yet properly postmodern and semiotically aware. I would say it's merely ultramodern. GA is another one of the last gasps of modernity. Modernity being a dead-end detour from the semiotic consciousness of medieval times, as in Thomas Aquinas. GA, I would say, is still mired in modernity's way of ideas, to use Leibniz's phrase. Now, true, GA is an attempt inspired by René Girard to articulate a complete semiotic theory, one that even dares to include a treatment of the origin of the human use of signs. But in its thinking of the origin, GA's anthropology is a nominalist anthropology. GA omits animality from its definition of the origin of language in the semiotic animal. GA radically fails to account for the nonverbal inlay in linguistic communication, thereby excludes the animality of the semiotic animal. It condemns itself to cling to a dogmatically nominalist position like this. Right? The species is our construct, highlighted there. I mean, note Gans's assumption of nominalism here. Nominalism, again, that's where individuals are real and independent of our mind. This is real, independent of my mind. But a species is purely mental and mind-dependent, right? Like bottled water is a general concept. Well, that's purely mental. There's no such thing as bottled water in general. There's just individual bottles. Okay, that's nominalism. But it's the way of thinking GA adopts. And uh, that's the source of its uh, undecidability about um, uh, did God create man or man create God? Well... Language does its thing. Who can say? Well, that's GA's point of view, and it's a dogmatically agnostic position, which I find redolent of modern philosophy's dubious epistemology. Uh, You can indulge me. I'm a professor of uh, medieval philosophy, so I'm allowed to have my point of view. Uh, It's a well-argued point of view, so please engage me at your uh, leisure. This dogmatic position is a result of, quote, the distinct ontological status to language and other forms of human representation, end quote, assumed by Gans, which is the same as that of semiology. Again, what's semiology? What's its approach? Why is it nominalist? It's because it conceives of language dichotomously, that is cut off from everything else, it conceives of language as a self-contained totality. Something purely mind-dependent, to which, quote, nothing in nature is comparable. But this unwarranted assumption by Gans has now been shown to be fallacious, thanks to the scientific work in the field of biosemiotics, which has been developed from the pioneering semiotic work of Thomas Sebiok. And uh, Petrilli and Ponzi have written a tribute to him, and, and uh, a few pages from that are what are included on the handout for you. Right? It's, it's Sibiak who exposed and refuted uh, the fallacies of semiology. I mean, semiology takes whatever insights are in semiology, but he enfolds them into a global view, a much broader program of global semiotics. The semiological part is not mistaken for the semiotic whole in Sibiak. Well, briefly, the semiotic alternative to semiology and its self-contained totality, the alternative is this. The human species shares with other animal species the fact that each species brings something species-specific to its generic animal modeling system. And in us, the unique syntactic role of the primary modeling system has been carefully distinguished by biosemiotics. Biosemiotics uses modeling systems theory as proposed by Sibiak. And so if you look at your handout on page 28, in the, in the middle of uh, the third paragraph, it says that in light of semiotics, viewed as a modeling systems theory, semiosis, which is a capacity that pertains to all life forms, semiosis may be defined as, quote, the capacity of a species to produce and comprehend the specific types of models it requires for processing and codifying perceptual input in its own way. Biosemiotics has now properly distinguished the role of what Sibiak calls language, language in its root sense, not your ordinary use of the term, by distinguishing between the primary, secondary, and tertiary modeling systems through systems analysis. This is from your handout, uh, page 28. The question of modeling is more complex than the human species owing to the fact that its modeling device is capable of producing multiple worlds, and in this sense is singular, exceptional, unique. Sibiot calls this species-specific modeling device peculiar to humans language. 
he distinguishes between language understood as a primary, that is, a, a original and fundamental modeling device in the human species, and speech, which appeared rather late in human evolution, precisely with Homo sapiens, according to the standard subdivision of hominids into their evolutionary phases. The crucial distinction, okay, the crucial distinction here is between language, or what some have called the interior word, and speech, what some have called the exterior word. Maybe that's a more helpful way for you to think about it. Seviot calls language our species-specific modeling device because of the fact that it's virtually certain that Homo habilis was endowed with language, but not with speech. So reading from the bottom of page 28 of your handout, Seviok's distinction between language and speech, according to which language is primary modeling, capable of constructing multiple worlds, and is therefore the condition for the evolution of humanity and speech, the capacity for verbal communication. Now, Seviok's distinction has nothing in common with the distinction postulated between language and speech at the foundation of linguistics for over a century. And then you see on your hand it goes to discuss Saussure, if you've heard about semiology of Saussure. This is what Seviok is differing with. So don't mistake uh, Saussure's distinction between long and prole. Don't mistake that for the difference between language and speech. No, Seviok means something different with his distinction. In Seviok's terminology, again from your handout, Seviok's language designates the mute species-specific modeling capacity, the inner word, right? What's in the mind before it's even uttered outside? The inner word which hominids have been endowed with since their appearance on the planet. The capacity to invent different worlds through to the current worlds invented by Homo sapiens sapiens. Instead, speech refers to articulate verbal language. Human beings for a very long time communicated in different ways before they knew how to communicate verbally. Therefore, language is the name of the primary modeling device with which human beings are endowed and which renders them capable of producing multiple worlds. Consequently, with the appearance of speech, that is the articulated phonatory capacity, there emerges a plurality of historical natural languages, French, English, German, in turn capable of modeling, and consequently there emerges a plurality of different cultures. To sum up then, this is 29, uh, page 29 of your handout, if you lost track where I was reading from. To sum up then, human beings are endowed with primary modeling, secondary modeling, and tertiary modeling. And the latter, tertiary modeling, is what cultural systems exercise on the behavior of individuals belonging to culture organized into such systems. Now, if you turn over the page and look at the middle of page 34, uh, middle of the third paragraph on page 34, there's a lot here, but uh, you know, it's your takeaway. You can go home and think about it all and ask some questions before you leave. Uh, middle of the third paragraph, page 34. In their evolutionary development... From the very beginning, hominids are endowed with language, in the sense described above, and therefore evolved to the point of becoming speaking animals, thanks to transformations of the physiological order allowing for articulation of the voice. On the basis of his claim that human verbal language is species-specific, Sibiak, often with cutting irony, debated against enthusiastic supporters of projects aiming to teach verbal language to captive primates. You can't teach it. Or clever hands, you know, the horse. Oh, the horse can talk. No, he's picking up on your nonverbal cues. It's a famous uh, episode you may have heard of. Go Google clever hands if you haven't heard of it. Such projects were supported by the false assumption that animals may be able to talk. Indeed, even more scandalously, are endowed with a capacity for language. They're not. Only we are. Now, this distinction established by Sibiak between language understood as a modeling device and speech understood as linguistic verbal expression is not only a response to wrong conclusions regarding animal communication, but it also constitutes a general critique of glottocentrism and anthropocentrism, two tendencies hard to die in the way of conceiving signs in the field of general semiotics. So the mute syntax of language which is what enables the internal modeling that we could call the inner word becomes a scientific marker of the emergence of a distinctively human animal species. Page 34. We know that, as Sibiak also claimed, language appeared and evolved as an adaptation much earlier than speech in the evolution of the human species through to Homo sapiens. And if, as we have claimed, the human modeling device differs from that of other animals insofar as they are capable of creating multiple worlds, this is due to a distinctive characteristic, what the linguist calls syntax the capacity to order single elements on the basis of operational rules. 
While for linguists, these elements are the words, phrases, and sentences of historical natural languages, CBOC's reference was to a mute syntax. Thanks to syntax, human language understood, not as a historical natural language like English, French, or German, syntax is a modeling device, similar, if we can make an analogy, to Lego building blocks. That is, it can reassemble a limited number of construction pieces in an infinite number of ways. As a primary modeling device, language produces an indefinite number of models. In other words, the same pieces can be taken apart and put together to construct an infinite number of different models. And thanks to language thus described, not only do human animals produce worlds similar to other species, we can imagine what is it like to be a bat, but we may also produce an infinite number of possible worlds. This, then, is the originary source of human desire. Human desire and its infinity of mimetic patterns. But besides the human modeling system, biosemiotics also discerns what is unique to the modeling systems of each species. An aardvark, a zebra, a giraffe. Okay, what's, each of them have something unique to their modeling system. I mean, for us, for humans, it's language, right? Understood as that mute syntax that's unique to us. So bio, biosemiotics discerns all this while still appreciating the modeling process itself is a phenomenon common to all living things, plants, animals. Consequently, one will observe that adaptation to the environment is common to all the diverse species, generating what is bodily innate. This is the biological heritage of each species. Right? Biologically innate, you can see it in the diverse and peculiar anatomies of the different species, which in turn condition their diverse modeling systems. Right? The, the bat has that ability that I don't have to see in the dark. But the exaptation of language in the human species has brought forth a species-specifically unique manifestation, which we can account for empirically without needing any recourse to innate ideas in the biological modeling system, or indeed without any retreat to a disembodied, self-contained, nominalist realm of purely arbitrary, socially constructed signs, which is the realm that GA or semiology valorize. Right? So people say, if everything's socially constructed, well, wait a minute, I have an anatomy. <laughs> it starts there first, before it gets to the tertiary modeling system. Right? The primary modeling system is rooted in what's unique uh, to your biological heritage. Species-specific exaptation. Now, maybe you don't know this term, but don't confuse it with adaptation. Um, I mean, the classic example of exaptation, uh, feathers on birds. I mean, originally, feathers are on birds for um, temperature regulation. Okay, so that's adaptation to the environment. Uh, but uh, for flying, that's an exaptation. You figure out a different use for them later on. Exaptation empirically explains that for which some have odiously postulated the presence of special ideas in our uniquely human cognition, right? Uh, the special arbitrary cultural ideas as if such things could be severed from all biology and animality. Uh, page 35, and the third paragraph of your handout says, similarly to language, the capacity for speaking, that is, articulate voice, also made its appearance subsequently as an adaptation, but for the sake of communication. Speech organizes and externalizes language. Again, that internal mute syntax. Subsequently, speech also ended up becoming a modeling device through processes of exaptation in the language of evolutionary biologists. Right? Stephen Jay Gould, look to him for that term. Okay, so to be precise, the exaptation of the biologically underdetermined portion of the primary modeling system, that exapted portion that CBIOC calls language, that is what at root distinguishes our species across all three modeling systems. Now, the fact that it is biologically underdetermined, which is what allows it to be exapted, right? You can use it for something else. Like, hey, I can use feathers for something else. I can use mute syntax for something else. It's the empiricist rejoinder to the semiological theories like GA that see language as a completely separate structural system. 
a mistake. Right? It's a mistake to make what is properly human entirely divorced from bodily animality. Uh, the empirical fact of exaptation demands that all semiologists must now become more empirical and abandon their nominalist treatment of signs, as if all signs were purely arbitrary. They're not. Right? You think that uh, red stop sign, that's just purely arbitrary, that's red and has those si- sides to it? It's not. I mean, part of it is, but where does the red come from? Because if you don't stop, bloody intersection. Right? And the shape of it, you know, it's got the feel of, you know, four crossroads. It's flat out wrong to define the human in terms of language that is entirely and structurally divorced from the semioses of animal life. Insofar as generative anthropology is founded upon its anthropological nominalism, severing language from biology, it remains at a disadvantage, I say, when compared to the Girardian approach, attempting to delineate the origin of the semiotic animal. As Girard so aptly observes of G.A., Gans, quote, impoverishes mimetic theory and lets fall away whole areas of archaic anthropology, depriving us of a whole mass of significant and revealing correspondences that are fully illuminated by that theory, end quote. Religion, in other words, is not just a byproduct of the adaptive evolutionary emergence of linguistic communication, but rather it pertains to the meaning of the whole sign system of the living universe. Religion's evolution can only have unfolded from the full amplitude of semiosis in both verbal and nonverbal communication, even if the mute mental act of language in Sibioc's sense is what any secondary or tertiary event of origin will have presupposed. On this account, then, Pache Gans, the truths of semiosis and its logic are able, in principle, to extend to the depths of our animality and even to what sustains it in its very being. God, the source of all being. We ought to refuse, therefore, to be caged by a mere anthropology. More promising is the semiotic bridge to animal semiosis developed by Sibioc. Using his terminology, we can outline Girard's semiotic scene such that we can establish at what point the human must have evolved within the gradualist unfolding of the semiotic scene being repeated again and again on the way from animality to humanity proper. Gans complains, he says, quote, the most serious problem in Girard's hypothesis, one that in a narrow interpretation would allow us to deny its status as an originary hypothesis altogether, is its lack of a theory of the sign, end quote. This is not true, since unlike Gans's outdated semiology, Girard's hypothesis fits perfectly well with Sibioc's global semiotics, as I may show you with a brief outline. Okay, this is how I can suggest to you how the first humans came about. So, stage one, uh, that crisis of undifferentiation, that's where you're all fighting for a, a seat, and it's, it's out of control. You, don't, you can't tell who started it, who started it. No, you started it, you started it. Okay, it's the same thing. Everyone's hitting everyone else. There's no difference between all of you in crisis. Okay? It's that everyone's the same is a sign of, it's a symptom of um, the community's in danger. Well, if this keeps going, it's a dangerous situation. The community's dead, right? You all kill one another. So a signal is given out. Let's find... Uh, the culprit. Let's find the culpable source. Who started it? Who started this fight? Only if we can find who started it, then can we end this uh, violent anarchy in the seats. You started it! Or maybe there's something, some gesture, or some word. Guilty! Right? You direct that. That's your signal. Stage two, you're trying to find out the guilty party. Well, if everyone, if all of you are shouting guilty at each other, then that's still violent undifferentiation. You're emitting the, the signal, trying to find the the culprit, but you haven't done it yet. Guilty. You all look the same. Ah, but look at me. I'm hiding out on the stage here. I'm I'm glad you haven't noticed me yet. But then suddenly when someone does notice me, it's like, hey, he's different from all of us. Right? He's not in this whirlwind of undifferentiation. He's obviously marked out as a target. Let's get him. He's the guilty one. He's standing there doing nothing. We're all fighting with each other. Okay, guilty. And then you all come up and lynch me. And that's stage four. 
With your violence, you indicate me as the one victim. And by the way, that's how you uh, achieve unanimity as a community. You found the guilty party. I'm your scapegoat. I'm dead. And then I can become a symbol thanks to the reversal of the violent mimetic crisis. Right? I am now, my dead body is now a symbol of peace. Right? You all feel good after you've got your aggression out of me. And even you, you can return on later days to my corpse and beat on me again. Oh, I feel better. And having a bad day, come back and on the scapegoat again. Okay, social peace. And even if my body is buried, maybe you all threw rocks at me, and that's the first tomb, by the way. I'm on the rocks. You turn this pyramid shaped rock tomb. You can bang on the tomb or throw another rock at it. You reenact this uh, communal ritual, and you're feeling fantastic. Right? Because. You're in touch with the symbol of your communal peace. So, in conclusion, what am I saying? Well, this is my suggestion to this whole controversy. This is my own personal contribution to the research that Gerard and Gantz and Sibiak are doing on these matters. Um, my suggestion is that eventually it's the fourth stage within the semiotic scene of scapegoating. The fourth stage in there is the leap from the animal to the human maid. When extensional indexicality entered into animal consciousness. You can make that, call it 4B or, or stage 6, if, if you will, but it's the name of the god, that stage. That is, it would have occurred at the point when the animals doing their scapegoating recognized that not only was their violence indexically designating their victim in a productive way, right, you're all beating on me and my body on the stage, right, and which brings you social peace afterwards, but then by extension... The scapegoat, who uh, at first for thousands of years was deified symbolically in stage five, but it's unconscious to you as animals. While you're still proto-humans, I'm just an unconscious uh, symbol of community. Right? Animals, animals have symbols too. We can talk about them in question and answer if, if you're unaware, but it's been established, like in the honeybee. It's very interesting. Um, by extension, the scapegoat, who at first for thousands of years was deified symbolically in an unconscious animal way, is then realized to be pointing back at the community. You can designate my corpse violently with a fist or a stone, and I can symbolically uh, represent your peace. But when the proto-human first recognizes that the God is pointing back at all of us, it's the God pointing back at our unanimous community. This is the totem that stands for us as uh, a socially peaceful community. When that's realized... The scapegoat is pointing to you as a unified human community. That's when the animal becomes human. Why? Because that would have been the first properly abstract human thought. The name of the God. Right? And the name could be, with the outer word could be like the, the fist, or it could be, or Putin, or whatever the name of the first name of the God was, but you know, it corresponds to the mute syntax, that internal realization of the difference between sacred and profane. Language's first inner word may then be externalized at food sharing and totem feasts as speech's first outer word, the name of God. This evolution of the species-specific extensional modeling characteristic of humans, right? extensional, the scapegoat now stands for the whole community. Actually, the deified scapegoat stands for the whole community. The species-specific extensional modeling, religion, characteristic of humans, marked by the thought of and the naming of God. Right? The name of God is the first word. This would have charged the symbolism of the previous animal prohibitions and rituals that had evolved around scapegoating with a now immense new significance, making possible the explosion of human culture that we observe suddenly occurring 50 to 60,000 years ago. And it's from this origin of human culture the extension of animal scapegoating rituals into the first word of language, God, which must also be heard silently in the mute syntax, the syntactical separation of sacred and profane in thought. Uh, this marks the very root of the distinctively exapted human modeling system. And it's from this origin that human desire was born. Human desire... Mimetic as it is, it's distinctively mimetic in that it can transcend all merely animal desire, even though it's rooted in animality, and its origin cannot be understood apart from its generation in the violent rituals that incubated in hunter-gatherers the syntactic forms of human thought. 
which our species-specific modeling system accepted as language and speech. Because of this, human desire is capable of transcendence. Girard, I believe, is correct to maintain that only the event of a conspecific victim of scapegoating violence would be sufficient at some point to motivate the evolution of indexical modeling into extensional modeling. Only the community's conspecific victim needs to be draped behind the name of God. This is the human experience of the power and peril of human desire, of the Don Draper in every one of us who drapes the past's hidden victim, craving something more, transcendence, and remaining only dimly aware of the history of human desire, of the things hidden since the foundation of the world. Well, look at you. What do you want me to say? We can take any questions if you like. Oh, thank you. Thank you.